In January of 2007, the Shetland Islands experienced a truly horrifying crime. Investigators say that famous children's author, Richard Horn, better known as Harry Horse, took his own life alongside his wife, Mandy, in an apparent romantic pact. But the story that detectives shared with the public, well, it isn't at all what it seems. Born in May of 1960, Richard spent the first decade of his life growing up in a farmhouse called Church Farm Cottage, located in Brandon Coventry, alongside his parents Derek and Josephine and his three sisters. Brandon is known for being a super small village with a population of just about 500 people. Now, this village is home to several incredibly old cottages and pubs, and when you think of old-timey England, this is probably the type of place you think of. Small, quiet, quaint, and super rustic. Richard's family also had a second home in Salka, where they would spend their vacations fishing and swimming and hanging out on their boat, which they named the Ormond. By 1970, the family moved to Warwickshire, and it's here that Richard found his true love, storytelling. He would tell his sisters that their house, known as Christmas Hill Farm, was one of the resting spots where Santa Claus stopped to take a rest while delivering Christmas presents to children all over the world. He was always coming up with crazy stories to tell others, and it seemed like he did a great job at it. These are pretty captivating stories that almost always seem to have some basis in reality, just enough to make them believable. Now, growing up in the countryside gave Richard a sense of freedom, and he loved horseback riding and spending time in nature. In fact, many years later after his passing, tales would be told of how his horse would often come home without him when Richard wasn't ready to head home yet. And that's pretty telling of how much Richard loved the outdoors when even his own horse would say, okay, I think that's enough. As for how he got the pseudonym that he was so well known by, well, it was all thanks to the headmaster at his school, who during roll call accidentally pronounced his surname as horse instead of horn. And the moniker stuck for the rest of his life when he decided that he would make it the perfect pen name, Harry Horse. At age 13, he would develop a love for cricket, a popular sport in the UK. He started playing cricket while attending Reckon College, and here Richard really began to hone his skills as a storyteller and an illustrator, and even won awards for his drawings. After graduating from Reckon College, Richard found a job at a lawyer's firm, where he started to gain some valuable experience, but for Richard, well, his attention was more focused on the artistic side of his personality, as was evidenced by a decision that he made when he turned 19. A decision that would alter the course of his life forever. While waiting for a train at Coventry Railway Station one December morning, Richard found himself thinking about the life that lay ahead of him, as he'd been thinking of relocating to Edinburgh. Unable to make up his mind, he chose to leave the decision up to a flip of a coin, with heads sending him back to London and tails meaning that he would move to Edinburgh. The coin landed tails up, and a short while later, he boarded a train that was headed for Scotland. Now, life in Scotland wouldn't be easy, and he didn't really have any jobs lined up as an illustrator, nor did he have anything else going for him for that matter. But he devised a plan. He dressed himself up like a college student and started attending drawing classes, unbeknownst to the rest of the students and the faculty members. He would basically just sneak into class, learn what the professor was teaching for the day, and then sneak out before anyone realized he was there. He basically pirated college courses. Richard used his skills to create a portfolio of his best work, attempting to get a publishing deal by showing it to local publishers. Now, unfortunately, none of them showed much interest, and things were not going the way he had envisioned, and so he had to come up with another cunning ruse. He'd already spoken to the well-known publishing house, Canongate, and he was turned down. But in 1981, he contacted them again, this time posing as his own literary agent. Richard claimed that his client, Harry Horse, was in Edinburgh for a short while, and that he would love to meet up to show off some of his work, and finally, they agreed. At the time, Canongate was owned by its founder, Stephanie Wolf Murray, and she found him to be just the type of talent that they were looking for. He was given a job as an illustrator for Magus the Lollipop Man, which was authored by Michael Mullen. And shortly after, he supplied the sketches for David Hamilton's The Good Golf Guide to Scotland. In 1986, an updated version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was announced, and Richard also supplied the artwork for that release, which was a pretty major job. He'd certainly made it as an artist by this point, but still unsatisfied with his life's trajectory, he decided to try his hand at publishing a book of his own. 
But Richard, he could have never guessed what the future had in store for him. Richard wrote his first book entitled The Okopogo, My Journey with the Loch Ness Monster. And quite unbelievably, his first efforts saw him receiving a Scottish Arts Council Book Award. This did his career a world of good, and soon he was producing many more popular children's books, most of which included animal characters. His book The Last Polar Bears saw him make his debut on the small screen as it was made into an animated movie, and shortly after, two of his other books, The Last Cowboys and A Friend for Little Bear, also made appearances on television, and Richard's career was now in full swing. He'd finally made it as a published author and illustrator, and his life was shaping up to be exactly what he had always dreamed of. By 1989, Richard had started to explore other aspects of his creativity, and had started his own band, touring across the country. In fact, they were in the midst of a tour in the Shetlands when he met Mandy Williamson, the girl who would eventually become his wife. The two got married the following year and found an apartment in Edinburgh, where they lived with their dog named Rue, who Richard would later feature in many of his stories. Now, the apartment didn't offer much room, but they were happy to make it work, and Richard's friends would describe Mandy as the counterpoint to his volatile nature. Basically, she helped even out Richard's wild nature and calm him down to a certain extent, but Richard was still hungry. See, Richard had a serious love for his dog, Rue. He was an animal lover through and through. The two could be seen everywhere together and even took him to business meetings. In fact, Rue would also be the catalyst for the next stage of Richard's career. After Richard and Mandy were married for about a year or two, Richard began to feel that his books featuring Rue weren't getting enough attention. Thus, he and Rue entered the offices of the Scottish newspaper, Scotland on Sunday, to complain about their lack of coverage of his books. Luckily, he brought several of his illustrations with him, and upon seeing them, the newspaper's editor suggested that he start working for them as a freelance political cartoonist. And while it was a pretty drastic change of pace for Richard, well, he accepted the offer. He would stay in this role for the next six years, drawing caricatures of famous politicians and the situations that they found themselves in at the time, quickly making a name for himself as one of the biggest political cartoonists of his generation, as his drawings could be seen in well-known newspapers that included The Guardian, The Independent, The Telegraph, and The Times. His reputation as a talented illustrator and cartoonist had now started to spread, and he even created the cover artwork for the New Yorker magazine on two occasions, while also drawing a satirical cartoon for the Scotsman on a weekly basis. But Richard and Mandy's life together, well, it wasn't as perfect as it seemed from the outside. After 18 years of marriage, it would all come to an end thanks to one unthinkable act carried out by Richard. By 2004, Richard and Mandy had decided to move back to the Shetland Islands in Scotland. This decision came after they received the unfortunate news that Mandy was suffering from a seriously aggressive form of multiple sclerosis, or MS. The change in Richard's demeanor from this point on is a testament to how much he loved his wife, as he became ever more depressed at her failing health, and before long he'd started to use illegal substances to cope with her loss of mobility and their lives together. His family would later reveal that he found it increasingly difficult to see her struggling with the condition, and it caused him to fall into a deep, deep depression. By 2004, Mandy's condition had worsened to the point where she was barely able to talk, and she had to receive constant care, which caused Richard a great deal of worry. In fact, he once commented to friends that he hated having to bathe and change his wife every day. Now, it's unclear if he hated doing this in general, or if he hated that her health had failed her, but I tend to believe it's most likely the latter, as Richard was more than willing to do whatever was necessary for his wife. Though, admittedly, Richard hated the fact that the two had moved back to the Shetlands to be closer to Mandy's family, as it was a very quiet and calm area, and Richard had grown used to the hustle and bustle of London over the years, thriving in the chaotic lifestyle. Those he spoke to about his concerns took it as a sign that Richard was still very much in love with his wife, and that the decline in her health was starting to take a toll on him. But these days, there are many people who disagree with this sentiment. See, since Richard was still taking illegal substances during this time, his behavior had grown ever more erratic, and it's believed that he started resenting the fact that he had to look after Mandy while living in a comparatively isolated area. By this point, Mandy had grown from being the center of his world 
to being more of an obstacle in his way. At least that's the opinion of some people looking back on Richard's life. Richard had now become prone to fits of rage. And one social worker would report that he becomes so angry during a discussion about Mandy's rights to disability benefits that he punched a hole in a wall in their house. But this was only the tip of the iceberg. Richard's mental health would only get worse from here. And it didn't take long before it reached a boiling point. And Richard, well, he finally snapped. In the days and weeks before the crime, Richard retreated further into depression and his addiction got much worse. He would eventually cut off all contact with his family, an act that's always worrisome when someone's dealing with depression and struggling to come to terms with difficult circumstances. He did keep in contact with some of his friends though, and in January of 2007, he invited two of their friends over to their place for dinner. But the evening didn't exactly go to plan, and Richard was acting strangely all night. The two friends would later tell investigators that Richard had, at some point in the evening, used an unspecified medication, after which he became agitated and on edge, which caused him pretty serious concern. They added that after taking the substance, he became more animated than normal, and he was walking around the house muttering to himself, at one point saying, it's a wonderful night for a killing. Prior to this, Richard had been, for the most part, his normal, happy self, but now they could hardly recognize him. What worried them most of all is that they noticed that Mandy seemed to be afraid of him. As they were getting ready to leave, she asked him to stay over for the night since she didn't want to be left alone with him. The friends declined the offer, likely because they didn't want to get involved in the couple's marriage issues, but also probably because they didn't want to deal with Richard's strange behavior anymore. This guy was clearly out of his mind at this point. After turning down Mandy's offer, the friends left and didn't think much else about the situation, believing it would all blow over soon enough. But by the following morning, a couple of the friends returned to the house as one of them had left a piece of clothing there the night before. But when they walked through the front door, they were met with a terrifying, horrific sight. The friends had just walked into a crime scene. As the friends entered the couple's home, they were immediately caught off guard. As they stepped into the entryway of the home, they were met with a grisly sight. The couple's dog and cat had both lost their lives, and it was clear the damage done was intentional. The friends didn't know what to think, and they immediately began calling out for Richard and Mandy. Realizing that something was very wrong, they rushed into Richard and Mandy's bedroom, and their hearts sank. The couple was found lying side by side on their bed, both deceased. And this is where the case gets really strange, and many people are still left wondering what the motive was for the story that was concocted by investigators after they learned of the couple's passing. Since Mandy's family was living close by, they were quickly informed of her passing, though it would take several days before Richard's family ever received the news. When they finally did, the details sounded like something out of a fairy tale. The police told both families that Richard and Mandy had attempted to end Mandy's life via an overdose, since she was suffering too much to carry on, and Richard could no longer stand watching his wife's health deteriorate. But tragically, the attempt failed, and this left the couple more depressed and desperate than ever before. The media reported that they decided to enter into a pact that would bring an end to the suffering for both of them, and it was even hailed as a quote, true Romeo and Juliet tale. They were portrayed as a loving couple who couldn't face the world without each other, and that they decided that they would rather end their lives together than have to live the rest of their lives alone. As one would imagine, both families were devastated at hearing the news, but they accepted the version of events that detectives had offered them, since in their minds, there was no reason for them to hide the truth. But the thing is, they would eventually learn that the couple's passing was anything but romantic, though it would be more than six months after the incident that the truth would finally be revealed to the public. Those who knew Richard and Mandy were horrified to learn that they had taken their lives after the dinner party that evening. As awful as this already was, the details that emerged thereafter were even more shocking. It would turn out there was no pact. It wasn't an act carried out as a romantic gesture, and there was no agreement between husband and wife that this had to be done. Instead, whispers began to spread about how Richard had grabbed a knife from the kitchen and attacked Mandy in a tragic act of violence. 
We know that this wasn't a consensual act since investigators found defensive wounds on her arms and hands, and it would soon be revealed that he jabbed her as many as 30 times before bizarrely turning the weapon on himself. But before he did so, the knife that he was using broke during the attack, which just shows the ferocity of the situation. Imagine the amount of force that it takes to break a metal blade. Thus, Richard went back to the kitchen, grabbed another weapon, and then continued the assault until Mandy's life was over. The coroner's report would state that Richard had 47 self-inflicted wounds before he too lost his own life. The doctor who attended the crime scene was so shocked by what he found there that he had to take time off of work, stating it was the worst crime scene he had ever witnessed with his own eyes. While still under the impression that the couple had lost their lives in some sort of romantic pact, Richard's family agreed that they should be buried together. But when Mandy's family learned what had actually occurred that night, they were understandably outraged at how the case was handled by the authorities. More specifically, they were outraged that investigators had outright lied to them about the state of the crime scene. Mandy's father made it clear that he wanted everyone to know what had happened to his daughter, since Richard had been painted as being some sort of martyr by ending his wife's suffering and then claiming his own life in some sort of romantic gesture. At a press conference held after the true details of the crime were revealed, Mandy's father stated, quote, this was no pact, it was murder. Mandy had arranged to go with her mother to the dentist the morning they were found. She was not planning on ending her own life. In the aftermath of these revelations, Richard's mother spoke to the Sunday Times newspaper, and surprisingly, she took aim at Mandy and Mandy's family, revealing that she never liked Mandy in the first place. She claims that when attending the couple's wedding, Mandy's family had failed to arrange flowers for the church ceremony, as they had agreed to do. And she took offense to the fact that she and the rest of the family hadn't been invited back to Richard and Mandy's house the second half of the reception. Now, this may sound like petty squabbles between a bride and the groom's family, and this is commonplace, right? But that's not the full story. Richard's mother added that Mandy was a very difficult person to get along with, saying she was quick to criticize Richard when he was in the midst of doing something that she didn't agree with. She claims that Mandy would refuse to wash his cricket uniform since she didn't like any of the other players' wives. She was also critical of the way that he was raised as well as the schools that he attended. Richard's mother also says that she had to walk on eggshells around Mandy because she was so volatile and would fly off the handle at the slightest mention of anything she didn't agree with. But again, you could easily chalk this up to a groom's mother not liking his bride. Again, this is super commonplace. It should also be mentioned that the rest of Richard's family didn't necessarily agree with his mother's statements though, just to add a bit of context. In fact, the rest of Richard's family loved Mandy just as much as Richard did. But still, it gets worse. According to Mrs. Horn, Richard and Mandy had both been taking illegal substances in the months leading up to the incident. Mandy had been doing so to relieve the pain that she was in as her health was failing, and Richard eventually joined in to help cope with the impending loss of his wife. And while most of us may not agree with this decision, you have to admit it's somewhat understandable. Several of the couple's friends contacted Richard's family after the truth of the crime was finally revealed, saying how much they liked Mandy and how they were struggling to come to terms with how Richard could have carried out such a violent and unexpected crime. This heartbreaking tragedy took everyone by complete surprise. And considering how many people spoke lovingly of the couple, heck, even two of their friends who had dinner at their house that night couldn't have predicted this was about to happen. Well, it was just a shock to everyone. Now, rather obviously, there have been many people who are critical of how the police handled this case. Obviously, there was no point in lying to the family about what had actually taken place here. It's understandable they may have wanted to spare the family from the heartache and burden of knowing how the crime really unfolded, but that burden was the family's to bear. It's not up to the police to decide who gets to grieve a loss or how they grieve it. When questioned about this in interviews by the media, the Shetland police defended their handling of the case, stating that any suggestion that they attempted to hide certain details of the crime from members of the two families or the public was completely unfounded, though no one has been able to explain why Richard and Mandy's deaths were portrayed as a romanticized pact to end their own lives when that clearly wasn't the case. It's obvious from this statement alone, the police are just outright lying. When preparations were being made for Richard and Mandy to be buried, Richard's sisters, Kay and Mary Ann, revealed what they thought of the horrific crime and the events leading up to it. 
They believed that Richard had purposefully started distancing himself from his family since he'd been planning to end Mandy's life, as well as his own, for quite some time. They also speculated that he only did this to strengthen his resolve, or else he would have been made unable to follow through with his plans. Basically, if he would have maintained contact with his family throughout the months leading up to the crime, he may have felt too much guilt and been unable to actually go through with it. Speaking to a reporter, they also suggested that the move back to the Shetlands would have played a major role in Richard's state of mind, and that it would have added to his feelings of despair. Richard obviously didn't want to be there, and this was painfully obvious. Now, it should be noted that when the sisters made these statements, they were still under the impression that the couple had willingly taken their lives together. So while they knew that Richard had taken Mandy's life, they didn't know at this point in time that he had done so against her will. It would only be when they traveled to the Shetlands for the funeral that they were briefed on the actual events that took place. In the end, no one will ever truly know what was going through Richard's mind when he decided to end Mandy's life, as well as his own. But this case shows that anyone's life can be irrevocably changed at any time. And it's up to each of us to decide how we deal with those changes. At some point in our lives, we're all going to get horrible news. But that doesn't mean we have to go to the lengths that Richard did to try to make things right. It's not our job to play God. It's our job to make the best with what we have. When reading statements from people who knew the couple, it becomes clear that there was never any doubt that the two truly loved each other. But what drove Richard to carry out such an unthinkable crime? Well, we may never know. Some people believe he did it because Mandy's suffering had become too much for him to bear, while others think he may have been in the midst of some psychosis due to the substances that he was using. The truth is, we just don't know. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.